the reality of coming through the gates to glory and before the throne of God and being in your very presence and being able to, to listen to you and, and to make requests known to you and to, to realize that in your presence there isn't anything that can get us. We are sheltered in the arms of God. Lord, we thank you for the privilege that we have tonight of being in this place tonight. We're grateful for the way that you have put things together for this to, to be uh, a reality for us, an event for us. Thank you for the people that you have in our lives and for the way that you have spoken to their hearts and uh, for the burden that they had for, for the church and not, not only ours, but the valley, the burden that they carry for them all. Lord, I just thank you that they stepped forward and they did something. And they made things happen and they put this, this moment together. Without question, it will amount to nothing if we do not meet with you. We need the outpouring of the Spirit of God upon our souls tonight. We need you to reach through all the stuff in our lives, all the things that distract us or, or even hinder us from keeping our eyes locked on you. We need you to, to investigate our souls to the abyss, to, the, to that depth where, where nothing can hide from you and where you are able to, to penetrate there and to point out things to us so that we can make things right before you, whatever it might be. And I pray, Lord, that you'll find, that, that you'll create in us a, a safety, a, a, a liberty for us to be able to, to go to places that we haven't been able to go to, maybe ever. Maybe it's been something we've been holding on to for a long time. Help us to find safety in your presence and to allow you to go to those depths, to those quiet places, to those locked doors of our soul, I pray. I pray again for your anointing upon Brother Raven Hill. I pray, God, that you will touch him. I pray that you will uh, uh, it fill him with a fresh anointing of God and may the words that he has for us Whatever they might be, may they be your words for us through him, we pray. We pray that you remove anything that could be a hindrance to the message that you have for us tonight. Lord, again, thank you for all you've done. Thank you for all of these that have come out. What a blessing. What an encouragement this is. And we give you all the praise, glory, and honor. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I want to, uh, um, I want Denise, and I want you two to just stand. Would you just stand? I, I, want, I want you to know that the burden was placed on these two ladies, and they reached out to the Raven Hills. They put everything together. They did the advertising. They did. They did it all. And I think I appreciate what they've done. It's it's going to be great for my church, and it's going to be great for this valley that we carry a burden for. But I want I want you to appreciate them tonight. Stand right there. Just stand right there. Thank you. Especially with Nancy. It's just been such a blessing. 
Um, if you get the opportunity to shake her hand and say hello also in addition to David, please do so. Um, I just want to go over a few things. Um, the first thing I want to say is that it is true that we have an amazing guest with us for the weekend. But this weekend and this time is about one person only, and that is the person of Jesus Christ. Amen. That's what this is about, and that we would become closer to him. So I just want to go over a couple of basic things before I go into the introduction. Um, tonight, of course, is one session, and tomorrow we will be meeting again at 9.30, and then there will be a break with goodies, and then we will have another session at 11. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with our worship center, um, the restrooms for men are right out here to the right, and for the women to the left, and we do have a nursery, if you have, and I don't know if there's any children here, but... Uh, for tonight or tomorrow, if you have a child that you need to take to a quiet place, that we have the nursery. We also have in the foyer TV screens where you can sit on comfortable couches and listen if you do need to step out of the sanctuary. I would ask that you would please <coughs> turn your cell phones off, uh, or at least on silent. Uh, we want to keep disruption, distraction, just bare minimum, okay? so that the Lord has our focus. Um, we will not be taking an offering tonight, but please come prepared tomorrow uh, that we will be taking an offering for uh, David and Nancy and their ministry. And I want to mention that in looking at speakers in the past, most all speakers ask for a fee, sometimes three to 5000 and that was unsettling to me. Mr. Ravenhill does not ask for a fee. He trusts the Lord. So I'm just asking that we would all come with open hearts and bless them. Um, okay, I just want to tell you a few things about David and Nancy. They have been married and in ministry for 52 years. They are living in Arkansas now. And they have three daughters and eight beautiful grandchildren. They have one daughter living in China in full-time ministry. Um, they, David was born in England, and they have both served alongside of David Wilkerson out of New York City, and also served alongside of Mike Bickle from Kansas City, if you've heard of either one of those. They, those are two men that have had great ministries. David is the son of Leonard Ravenhill. Uh, many of you have heard of him and maybe read some of his books. He's gone on to be with the Lord. And um, David will have his books available here tonight and hopefully tomorrow, unless he sells all of them. But um, I, I highly recommend David's books. About 10 years ago, um, I got the opportunity to meet David here in the Valley. He was here teaching in 06. And I began to read his books and to listen to him online. Uh, you can catch him on YouTube, uh, a lot of his sermons. But just a couple books I'd like to recommend. If you are anyone in ministry, a pastor, on worship team, or serving in ministry, uh, be sure to look into Surviving the Anointing. It is a must read. The God of Grace is another one that I've read. Really, really good book. And for God's sake, grow up. <laughs> That's being passed around our Bible study, and uh, a lot of people are enjoying that, and hopefully it's helping us all grow up. Nancy also, uh, David's wife, she has a book, Touched by Heaven, and I know it's being passed around our church, but her book is a lot about her childhood and life story and her encounters with Christ. Um, great book, and it'll be available out there also. Um, David's focus is to see us come to spiritual maturity. So that's what this weekend is about. And so, without any more words, would you join me in welcoming David Ravenham.
an introduction like that, and I'll admit to hear myself speak. <laughs> Thank you. What a blessing. I appreciate the uh, time we had of uh, singing. One of my lacks, great lacks, is in the area of music. Many years ago, somebody heard me singing and informed me at the end of the service that I was a prison singer. I have no idea what a prison singer was. I'd never heard that term before. And so I said to the person, uh, what do you mean I'm a prison singer? They said, you're behind a few bars and missing the key. <laughs> <laughs> Any other prison singers here? <laughs> Thank you. And then the Bible says, let's make a joyful noise. It doesn't say it has to be pitch perfect. So not only that, I'm left-handed and tongue deaf, and so I just, God cannot hold me accountable on that day for neglecting the gift that I never had. So that's one of the, the joys I can look forward to, that I don't have to give an account of something I never used because I never had it to use. But, uh, anyway, it's a delight to be with you tonight. And, uh, you know, God's Word, if I could uh, rename it, would be God's Lost and Found Department. And I want to speak to you tonight about uh, a man that lost something. As you know, the Bible is full of lost and, uh, lost and found stories. There's nothing worse than losing something. I, about uh, a little over a year ago now, in fact, uh, uh, next uh, Sunday, not this coming Sunday, a week Sunday, I will be back in the uh, UK ministering at uh, the Bible College of Wales. And I went there last year. And after traveling about uh, 20 plus hours, I had all day to wait in New York City, changed uh, airports from LaGuardia to uh, JFK, then I flew to Scotland, then from Scotland down to Wales, then I had to take two buses and a train to get to Swansea where the Bible school is. I got on the first uh, bus, and about halfway into the city, I realized I'd left my backpack at the airport and uh, had my two passports, and then I have an American passport and a British passport. Actually, I have three. I have a New Zealand one, but that wasn't in it. And my Bible and all my notes and everything else, and here I am on this bus in the middle of the country. And the airport was way out, and I think, oh my goodness, what on earth am I going to do? And uh, anyway, long story short, I was able to get another bus back, talk to the bus driver, stop the bus, let me off, flag down the taxi, got back to the airport. And fortunately, somebody had turned in my backpack. But there's nothing worse than losing something. You know, you misplace your car keys, you lose your passport, you lose something, and just a frustration. And the Bible is full of uh, people that lost something. We have the man that had a hundred sheep and they lost one. A lady that had ten coins and she lost one. A man that had two, uh, two sons and he lost one. We've got uh, Saul who was crowned uh, king when he was out looking for his uh, father's lost donkeys. We've got David who went out to battle with the Philistines and then they rejected him by the time he got back to Ziklag where he lived with all of his men and being plundered by the Amalekites and uh, he lost everything. Thank God it goes on to say that David recovered all. And there's nothing like recovering something that you lost. It's one thing to lose it, it's another thing to recover it. And so the story I want to look at tonight is uh, found in 2 Kings. If you have your Bible, you can uh, look at it with me. Maybe it's on the screen, I don't know. But uh, if it isn't, uh, open your Bible to 2 Kings chapter 6. Let me give you the, uh, the background to this uh, particular story. It is a Bible school. Uh, more specifically, it is a school of the prophets. If there's one school I would love to go to, it would be this particular school. Most people say it was started by Samuel, and then uh, Elijah took over after Elijah was caught up to glory, then Elisha took over at this particular stage. Elisha seems to be the, uh, the man that is in charge of the school. We know there are at least 50 students by previous accounts, because uh, when Elisha was caught up, it talks about 50 of the students at least that went out uh, looking for him and so on. And so, you know, it's a small Bible school, again, a, a group of uh, men that were together seeking to uh, hear the voice of God. That's what I like about this Bible school. It wasn't just a school about eschatology and this or that or the other thing. It was a school about the moving of the Spirit. And boy, did we ever need to know how to be led by the Spirit of God. Amen. You know, one of the great challenges in, in my life, I'm sure your life, is to hear clearly the voice of God. And so here you have a group of men 
that have taken time off from their whatever schedules they had to sit under the ministry of this man and to uh, learn to recognize the leading of the Spirit of God, the school of the prophets. And like I said, it's, uh, apart from the school that Jesus had, this is the other school that I would have loved to, you know, have a semester in. You know, can't imagine anything greater than that. And uh, so I want to break this story down. It's only seven verses, beginning in verse one down to uh, verse seven. But uh, I like to, uh, as somebody said, when you read the Word of God, you should inch your way through it. After you inch your way through it, you should half inch your way through it. After you half inch your way through it, you should quarter inch your way through it. In other words, many times we'll have our devotions and say, you know, I read through the whole book of Ruth this morning and my devotions, or I read through the book of Romans this morning, or I read through the book of Philippians, or whatever it is. But, you know, have you really understood it? We tend to gulp down vast portions of the Word of God and we don't really meditate on it. Somebody said meditation is like a, a cow chewing its cud. You know, it spends hours out there grazing and gulping down vast quantities of grass and then it sits down and out of one of its three or four stomachs, regurgitates that, however all that works, I don't know, and begins to masticate on it, takes that grass and chew it over. You know, that's, uh, that's what meditation is. It's taking a portion of the Word of God and just chewing on it, so to speak. And so we want to chew on these seven verses tonight. I will get you out of here by midnight. No. Uh, but, uh, we won't quite chew on it that long enough. But uh, I'm going to uh, bring out some things that are there, but they're not there, if that makes sense. And the first thing is uh, their uh, convocation. If you look at the word convocation in the dictionary, it means a gathering for a particular purpose, a gathering of students and so on. But this is a, a gathering, if you muse on that verse 1, you have to come up with a conclusion that there was a meeting of the student body, if I can put it that way. These students got together. We know for a fact that uh, the leader of the group, who happened to be Elijah, Elisha rather, was not there, he was not present. Uh, later on, uh, he is involved, but these were just the students, and they had this convocation, whether somebody blew the shofar or something, and announced, that, listen, you know, we need to have all the students meet in the, uh, you know, the, uh, the classroom or wherever it was, but they had, uh, again, this, uh, this meeting. The second thing is their evaluation. First of all, their convocation, their gathering together, their meeting, they had something specific in mind that they wanted to discuss. And the thing they wanted to discuss was uh, they were having an evaluation or an examination. Now, one of the things I never liked in school, I had two brothers that were brilliant, and I was the one that, uh, you know, kept uh, humility in the family. <coughs> uh, I brought home F's on my report card on more than one occasion. I, uh, I was always taught if a job's worth doing, it's worth doing well. <coughs> and I did it well, you know. I had more than one F. But, uh, <laughs> I don't know if that was a real application or not, but that was the, the thing. And one of the things I hated was the examinations. And especially when you had one of those teachers that said, you know, give your paper now, your exam paper, to the person behind you or the person beside you. And, uh, you know, Murphy's Law would always kick in. It was always the cutest girl in the class that you had a crush on that was going to mark your paper. Not only was she the brightest girl in the class, but the cutest, you know. And then the humiliation when she handed the paper back with an F on it, and she, I handed it back to her with an A+. Plus. You know, because there's no chance in the world I will ever get to know this girl, you know. But uh, examinations, I, I still don't like examinations, whether it's a mental exam or a physical exam, because you don't know what's going to turn up. And things that you do know about, you don't want everybody else to know about. You know, I knew I wasn't the brightest you know, the sharpest uh, blade in the, in the drawer, but uh, I don't want everybody else to know it. But uh, the Bible says we need to examine ourselves. Examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. It's good every once in a while to be brutally honest about your spiritual condition. Just take time alone, go into your closet, wherever it is, and, and allow the Spirit of God to speak to you. That's what the psalmist said, search me, O God. What he was basically saying is examine me. See if there's anything in me that is displeasing, if there's any wicked way in me, if there's any thing that I'm pursuing I shouldn't be pursuing, look, give me an exam. The Bible says examine yourself to see if you're in the faith. Now, you know, a lot of people can challenge that theologically and say, you know, obviously you're in the faith, how you? But uh, we need to examine ourselves. And so they've come together for a time of evaluation. And uh, they... Uh, 
discussing a particular thing. And their evaluation comes and it reveals something. The third thing is their dissatisfaction. Their dissatisfaction. They reach a unanimous decision. And the unanimous decision is we are not where we should be, we're not where we want to be. That's a good place. In other words, they were dissatisfied with the, the current situation. I don't know about you, but I, if I'm honest, I live in a state of constant dissatisfaction, not discouragement. Discouragement will paralyze you. Dissatisfaction hopefully will motivate you. There's nothing worse than stagnation, and stagnation comes from satisfaction. If you're satisfied, you're not going to do it. I'm satisfied. Don't bother me. I like things the way they are, and so on. You know, and so you stagnate. But if you are, if there's dissatisfaction, then you'll find an answer, hopefully, for the dissatisfaction. They come to the place after they've had a time of discussion. Again, this convocation, a time of evaluation. We are not where we should be. We don't want to continue on the way we are, and that is a, a good thing, or it should be at least when it comes to your spiritual life. I don't want to remain in the condition I'm in. Nor do I want to grow satisfied in the condition I'm in. You know, all the way through the Word of God, and obviously if you've read it, and most of you have, I, I know, the Christian life is always progressive. There's never a place where you sort of reach a place where you can sit down and say, all right. You know, the Apostle Paul, who was caught up to the third heaven, saw things that were unlawful to other and so on, and at the end of his life, that I may know him, you know, I, I press on, not that I've already attained. You know, here is a man that we would consider, you know, a genius, a brilliant when it comes to the things of God, a mature, seasoned man of God that gave us the bulk of the New Testament and so on, and yet uh, that dissatisfaction, I press on, I'm not satisfied, there's still more to, uh, uh, to attain to. And, uh, and so this is their situation, the dissatisfaction. Why were they dissatisfied? The next thing is their limitation. And that's where we pick it up. Uh, in this portion of scripture, verse 1, Now the sons of the prophets said to Elisha, Behold now the place before you where we live is too limited for us. The reason for their dissatisfaction was we are in a place that is too limited. And notice, they obviously, it says the sons of the prophets. It wasn't one individual which tells me there was, a, again, this uh, convocation because they said we all the way through it. In other words, it's a unanimous decision that they've reached. And they didn't just all wake up one morning, I guess, and they come together and say, oh, I have this dream and I have the same dream and so on. But obviously, there's been discussion. And the discussion is, they've talked about the situation where they're living. And they've reached again this conclusion after an examination, after an evaluation, that uh, where we are living is not satisfying us. It's too limited. It's too restrained. The place where we live, one translation says it's too small. My translation, using the New American, it says it is too limited for us. I don't know if you feel that way, but I do. If I'm honest about my life, there are certain things that, I, that are too limited in my life. I want to go from faith to faith. I don't want my faith to be limited. I don't my, want my love to be limited. I don't want my devotion to God to be limited. I don't want my prayer life to be limited. In other words, I don't want to be confined. When a place is too small, you're confined. You're not growing. There's no room for expansion. There's no room for enlargement. And they said, listen, we cannot remain the way we are. The place where we live again, it's too limited. Now, for a period of time, obviously, they were satisfied with their condition. And uh, there are times, again, when, uh, you know, for a while, you may be satisfied, but uh, we should never allow that to remain the state that we're in. Imagine a young couple, they get married and uh, obviously have no children, and so they uh, maybe rent or buy a little condo somewhere, maybe in a big city downtown, so they could get to the shops and to the uh, restaurants and so on, and they decorated the thing, and they, you know, love to show it off and have people over and say, this is our little uh, condo where we live, and we're so happy here, it's beautiful, we've got this little balcony that overlooks the city at night, you know, the, the lights come on, it's just a beautiful place, and, and so on, and then one day the uh, husband walks in, and his wife's, uh, you know, glowing, and uh, what's, you know, what's happened to you, type thing, and she said, guess what, uh, 
and pregnant. And all of a sudden, the place is too little. All of a sudden, you know, she realizes, listen, uh, we, we can't continue when this baby comes or these babies come, let's even, you know, say she's going to have twins. And uh, we can't stay in this place that we were happy in, this place with this uh, place we've lived in for the last two years, where we were, had a certain amount of contentment and so on. Now it's too small for us. We're going to have to move. Spiritually, it should be that way in our life. You know, there are seasons again where God blesses us and so on. We want to sort of build a monument to that thing, sort of camp right here. And God says, "No, I got more for you." You know, the path of the just is a shining light. It shines more and more. And the cry of our life should be, Lord, I don't want to be restrained. You know, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, it hasn't even entered in the heart of All the things that God has for us. And yet many times we set it up. We put our roots down, so to speak, spiritually. There's no longer any increase in faith, any increase in passion for God, and so on. We just begin to stagnate. You know, my passport is stamped sort of thing. If I die tonight, I know I'll go to heaven, but that's about it. And if that's your situation, then I pity you in one sense. You know, can you imagine not wanting to know more of God? Taste and see. You know, once you've tasted and seen, you know, there should be a, an insatiable longing for God's presence. A longing for more. Otherwise, I'd have to doubt whether you've even tasted it. At least when you've had a glimpse of God in some capacity, and God has revealed himself to you. Uh, if... Uh, if uh, I understand the word of God correctly, and I think I do on this, there should be a, a longing for more. You know, the Christian life is sort of cyclical. For years I wondered, you know, when Jesus said, if you hunger and thirst after righteousness, you'll be satisfied. You'll be filled. But then if you're filled, how can you hunger? But it's cyclical, isn't it? I'm sure most of you had a meal before you came to the meeting tonight. And uh, if I were to say to you, you know, could you uh, eat another meal? You say, no, I'm full. You know, I just ate an hour ago or an hour and a half ago. I'm full. But I guarantee, maybe before you go to bed tonight, most of you will get a little snack, or at least by tomorrow morning, you'll be ready for breakfast. That uh, that satisfaction will worn off, and now there's a, a new hunger. And I think God has put in His in each one of us that sort of cyclical thing where He'll satisfy us, but that satisfaction is never meant to contain us for too long. We never sort of camp around that thing because after a while it wears off and we begin to pursue him again. And so here we have a group of students again, they are dissatisfied. The place where we live is too restraining, it's too confining. We need to go from this place. And so the next thing is their decision. They make a conscious decision to do something about it. It's one thing to acknowledge your situation, it's another thing to do something about it. A lot of people will be glad to put up their hand and say, yeah, I acknowledge my faith is too small and I'm lacking in my love, I'm lacking in my desire for God, I don't read the word of God like I used to, and so on. I'm glad to acknowledge that, but it's another thing to say I'm going to do something about it. And uh, here they were, they made a decision, and the decision was to move from where they were. We're going to have to move from where we are. And spiritually, we need to move. It may not be a geographical move, but it's a, a spiritual move where we say, God, in fact, Nancy said to me on the plane coming up here, she said, Dave, Dave I need to tell you something. She'd done a, a little time of examination, and she said, God has spoken to me, and it was, uh, she talked about uh, Nancy Reagan, who just uh, died, and of course had the little uh, slogan, just say no. And my wife said, there's something I need to say no to. And she said, remind me of it. When we get back home, I've got to say no to this particular thing. That wasn't a major sin or even a minor sin in many ways, but it was something that she felt God was saying, listen, I, I want you to give that thing up. You know, but it came as a time of examination. And so there, there are times when we need to be brutally honest with ourselves and say, listen, I'm not where I should be spiritually. And here with these students now, this place, it served its purpose, but we need to move on. You know, God said that to the children of Israel. You've remained long enough on this mountain. Turn and what? Set your journey. They've gone round and round and round, basically treading the same ground for 40 years. And that uh, typifies many, many believers. They just go round and round and round. But they, they never sort of set their journey and move on into the purpose of God. And uh, so this is their decision now to uh, 
lent their co-workers, you like, and the strength of the states. And what is interesting, you'll find it there in verse 2, they go to Elisha and they say, please let us go to the Jordan. Please let us go to the Jordan. That is uh, not a popular message, going to the Jordan. We had a little brief time of prayer back there with a couple I had not met, but they're here tonight. And uh, uh, the uh, lady, during her prayer, said something about dying to self, was the gist of what uh, she was saying in her prayer. That is not a very popular message. But the Jordan is the place of death. The, the Jordan is where you descend. The only way you and I can make progress is if we descend. As John the Baptist says, I have to decrease, that he might increase. Uh, of course, we have messages of televangelists today, you know, it's all about God being your coach and you being a success. God is not interested in, uh, in your, uh, your will being done or anything else. You know, it's pray thy kingdom come, not my kingdom come. Amen. And uh, my kingdom has to die, my desires have to die. I have to go to the Jordan, the place of circumcision, the place of death, the place of surrender and so on. That is how you make progress in the Christian life, is by dying. I must decrease. Again, we've got to lose our life in order to find our life. Amen. And, uh, and the, the message of the, you know, the, the, the crucified life is not a popular message these days. You know, it's all about your best day yet, your best life now, and so on and so forth. It's all about God being the personal coach and trying to you know, make you a successful whatever man or woman of God and, and so on, and achieving great goals. And so on. No, it's about the kingdom of God. Thy will be done, not my will be done. And so here is this uh, request, go with us to the Jordan. We've got to descend. We've got to die to self. Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ, and less that I live with Christ lives in me. That's the Jordan, if you like, experience. The next thing is after making a decision, their determination. It says, uh, let us go and let us make a place to live. In other words, they were prepared to do something about it. Let us make a place to live. There's always the balance in the Word of God between what God does and what we do. Isn't that right? We are workers, what? Together with Him. That means that I've got to work as well as he, He's working. In other words, there's certain things God will not do. He will not, uh, he will not do my praying for me. He will not do my Bible reading for me. He will not do my witnessing for me or whatever it is. There's certain things we have to do. Here are these students and they say, listen, we'll go to the Jordan, go with us, and we will make, we'll, we'll do something. I find in the Word of God that the people that God used the most were people that were already busy. Isn't that right? When Elijah, anointed Elisha, it was uh, when he was plowing with his father's oxen. You know, David was anointed when he was out looking after the sheep. The disciples were already, most of them, you know, mending their nets. Jesus did not go down to the uh, unemployment line in Jerusalem and say, listen, I'm looking for 12 guys that I'd like to hire for a few years, you know, because I'm going to start building a kingdom. You know, no. God never uses lazy people. But as a study to show yourself approved under God. You know, pray, earnestly pray. I mean, it's always got it's something that you and I have to do. A workman that needeth not be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth and so on. So here are these men, and they said, listen, we are willing to work to achieve our goal. We will go, we will make a place for us. We don't expect it just to sort of materialize. You, your maturity in Christ will never just sort of materialize. You won't go to bed one night, wake up the next morning, you know, a godly saint, if you like, that is, uh, you know, everybody stands in awe of and says, whatever happened to you? Uh, I just went to bed one night and I woke up the saint. <laughs> it, it won't happen that way. It'd be nice if it did. Or, you know, if somebody lays hands on me, you know, and suddenly it will all change. You know? Hence, and I were part of the uh, revival there in Pensacola many, many years ago. And, you know, there was a wonderful move of the Spirit of God, hundreds of possibly thousands of people uh, got saved. And I happened to teach in the Bible school. And people would, uh, in the Bible school, every single night would sort of elbow their way through the crowd and get prayed for by some man of God. And, uh, I had to finally say to the students, listen, I believe in the laying on of hands, but one thing you cannot get imparted to you is maturity or character. Nobody can lay hands on you and impart character to you. It may be the impartation of gifts or something or other like that, or the anointing of the Spirit, but not, uh, not maturity, not character. 
And I think God is looking for spiritual character. That only comes by study, it comes by yielding to God and seeking God and allowing the Spirit of God to deal with you and so on. So here are these people that say, listen, we will go and we will make this happen. Like I said, God always uses active people. Moses was out looking after his father and sheep when God called him. You know, David was looking after his uh, father's sheep when God called him and so on. And there's always a price to be paid. My father died a number of years ago, now, now, now he died in uh, 1994. And uh, I remember visiting him before he had uh, sort of uh, his final uh, stroke. And he was still uh, ministering and still in pretty good health. And he said to me, uh, when he got up into his uh, late 70s and uh, 80s, people used to stop by the house all the time, especially seminary students would call him on the phone and say, Brother Ingram, I'm passing through, and you know, I'd love to have a little bit of uh, time with you, and uh, I know you're getting to be an older uh, gentleman now, and I would love it if you would uh, uh, lay hands on me so I could receive your mantle. And my dad said, I've had so many requests for my mantle. And then with a twinkle in his eye, he said to me, he said, David, everybody wants my mantle. Nobody wants my sackcloth and ashes. <laughs> In other words, there is a price to be paid for the mantle. Yeah. And the price, many times, we don't want to pay. The sackcloth and ashes, the weeping between the porch and the altar, the hours alone spent in prayer and so on. That, that's where the, you know, the, the real maturation comes in our life, isn't it? And so here we've got uh, people that say, listen, we are prepared to do whatever it takes to uh, bring this about. The uh, seventh thing, wherever we're up to right now, their submission. Again, notice in verse 2, please let us go to the Jordan. In other words, there is a group of students, they understand submission, they go to their leader, in this case it is Elisha, and they say to him, listen, we need your permission to do what we need to do. You know, one of the things that uh, I believe is important in our spiritual maturity is this whole area of submission. Submitting to authority. You will never allow, never have God use you in any great way unless there is an attitude of submission in your life. They understood that. The centurion that said to Jesus, I too am a man who under authority. And I say to this man, go and he goes and so on. You know, if there's an ounce of rebellion, in fact, uh, you know, I thought of teaching on prayer tonight, but, uh, you know, the, uh, in Ephesians chapter 6, where uh, Paul talks about we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. So many, many years I was thinking, you know, like Paul's little candle is getting low and he's only got a little bit of parchment left and he realizes, oh, by the way, I meant to talk about spiritual warfare. And he sort of shifts gears. Prior to that, he's talking about, you know, children obey your parents and slaves obey your masters and so on and so forth. And I thought, you know, Paul takes a coffee break and he comes back and says, yeah, there was one other thing about prayer. No, but there is a correlation between the two. Paul is laying a foundation, and the foundation is wives submit to your husbands, and then he always protects, it, if you like, the underdog, the person in submission. Husbands, remember, basically, you two have a master in heaven. I'm going to watch the way you treat your wife. And then he says, children, obey your parents. And then he says uh, to God, that the, the children, you know, you parents don't uh, abuse your children, basically. And then he says to the slaves, slaves, submit to your masters. And then he says to the masters, remember, master, you do have a master in heaven. So it's this whole chain of command. And then he goes into the matter of spiritual warfare. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Why does he do that? Because the devil became the devil because he refused to submit. In other words, if there is a smidgen, to use a good Obama expression, <clears throat> if there is a smidgen of rebellion in your life, you cannot wage war against the enemy. Because you're already, if you like, in league with him. Whether that's in a home, whether that's in a <coughs> situation, whatever it is, if there is any sort of rebellion at all, you've already aligned yourself with the very one that you're trying to come against. Because Satan's biggest problem was, I will not submit to you. You know, I've got all this beauty, all this wisdom, all this, you know, whatever, charisma and so on. You know, I can run the universe, just give me a shot at it. You know, you take my seat, I'll take your seat. And, Rebelling against the Lord. And so Paul deals with the whole area of submission, and then he says, now let's talk about principalities and powers. And, um, and so here we have a group of men, young students, that they go, and uh, they say, listen, 
we need your permission. We're not going to do this without submitting to you. Not only that, they go on to say, a little later on, they refer to themselves as servants. It says, please let us go to the Jordan, each one take from there a beam, let us make a place for ourselves where we may live. And he said, go. And one of them said, please be willing to go with your servants. So they understood again as a group that we are servants. We're not prophets, we're not, you know, and, and in other words, many times we, you know, we have this ego thing that, uh, you know, we want to claim some sort of apostolic ministry, some sort of prophetic ministry, or whatever. You know, he that is greatest among you, they become what? Servant of And the one thing I see in the school, one lesson they learn is, listen, we are still servants. Even though maybe one day God will put his mantle upon us and we'll be like uh, Elijah or Elisha and so on and so forth, we've got to keep in mind that we have to have the heart of a servant. And I appreciate that again, the submission. The story now changes. They arrive at their destination seemingly. They arrive at the Jordan. And now the story changes from looking at the group to one individual. And uh, the first thing about this individual is he is uh, now fulfilling his mission. If you want to put down his mission, it's no longer their mission, although they're involved as well, but it's his mission. In other words, he knows why he's there. He's got a goal, he's got a vision, he's got a dream. He's going to enlarge the place where he's been living along with the other students. They know the calling of God. They've got permission from the uh, the prophet of God, the mission, and uh, so they're in, uh, they're in a good place here. They're not just doing something out of rebellion, they're doing something out of submitting it to the man of God. He obviously is a man of God, since this is, uh, I believe this is the mind of God that we have. So they've gone to the Jordan. This guy has got his axe and he's cutting down trees. Maybe he's a sort of competitive sort of a guy and he's comparing himself to two or three other students there as a, you know, letting the, the trees fall and his pile is bigger than the other guys and he thinks I'm doing well and you know, I'm contributing to the overall uh, purpose here and uh, all of a sudden we have this frustration which is the next thing. One minute he's making progress. One minute he's fulfilling the, uh, the will of God, he's fulfilling his, uh, his ministry and the next moment he loses his cutting edge. In this case, literally, but also spiritually. He loses his cutting edge. His axe head flies off and doesn't just land beside him there on the ground. It falls into the river. And you know what happens to a piece of steel when it uh, hits the water. It doesn't flop. It goes down how deep it was there in the Jordan. I don't know. It could be three or four or five feet. It could be money at the time. But anyway, you know, he loses his cutting edge. One minute he's effective, one minute he's having success, one minute he's seeing his dreams fulfilled, he's seeing his goals fulfilled, he's fulfilling the will and the purpose of God as best he knows it, and the next minute, all of a sudden, the power is gone, and he is uh, totally incapacitated. Everything has stopped. And I believe that uh, there are many, many people in the body of Christ have lost their cutting edge. They can look back to a day, they can look back to a time, they can look back to a season in their life where the blessing of God, the anointing of the Spirit of God was on them. They were making, you know, you know leaps and bounds, spiritually speaking. God was blessing them. They were seeing souls saved. Their church was growing, whatever it may be. They had a prayer life where they were really sensing the presence of God. They had a burden. All of those things, and now if they were to be honest, brutally honest, listen, something has happened. I don't have the passion I used to have. I don't have the tears I used to have when I prayed. I don't have the, the same burden. I'm not giving the way I used to give. I don't read the Bible the way I used to read the Bible. You know, that something is missing in my life. You know, if, if, if I could only turn the clock back two years, three years, five years, ten years, whatever it is. I was a different man back then. I was a different woman back then. But something has happened. And here is this individual, again, his frustration because uh, he's lost the exit. Ecclesiastes, there's an interesting verse, Ecclesiastes 10, verse 10. It says, if the axe is dull, he must, and he does not take time to sharpen the edge, then he has to exert more strength. These days, we don't use axes quite as much. We have chainsaws. 
I had a chainsaw until I put gas in it recently and blew the engine without thinking. But anyway, that's another story. But you know, when that when that had a new blade on it, that thing would go through wood like you know a knife through butter. I mean, it was amazing. But after cutting for a while, everybody knows that edge gets dull and you sort of burn your way through the wood. You've got to exert more strength. I mean, initially, almost the weight of a blade will just go through. But once that cutting edge goes, or we talk about laboring, you literally have to, you know, force it. And the Bible says if the axe is dull and you don't take time to sharpen the edge, you know, we get weary sometimes in well-doing. That's what the Bible says. We get weary in well-doing. Not in doing sin, not in disobedience, and so on, just in well-doing, there's a weariness that sets in. It's a tiredness, tiredness that sets in. And we can lose that cutting edge. And we've got to take time to sharpen the axe. Time to acknowledge, listen, I'm not the man I used to be. I need to take time off. I need to get away for a few days. I need to get back to my devotional life. <coughs> Excuse me, and so on. I believe that in this case, the axe represents the power and the anointing of the Spirit of God. Let me say something. The axe represents the power and the anointing of the Spirit of God. I'll come to that again in a moment. The next thing, number nine, I think it is, is desperation. Is desperation. The Bible says there, verse 5, but as he was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water, and he cried out. <clears throat> I like that. He cried out. He doesn't just pretend, you know, well, maybe I'll do something else, you know, I've got a good pile there, or, you know, I don't want to, this is embarrassing, I don't want anybody to know about it, I'm not the man that I used to be, and so on, but, you know, I'll find something else to do, and I'll start picking up this, and sweeping this, and so on. Thank God that he acknowledges what he's lost. And when it says he cried out, I believe the cry is proportionate to what he's lost. Let me say that again. The cry is proportionate to what he's lost. You do not cry out when you lose a nickel. Is that right? I mean, you see pennies these days. My wife loves to pick up pennies on the street. And, uh, you know, if it's, uh, if it's 25 cents, I'll stop. But a penny of a stupid guy. My wife picked him up. But you know, you don't cry out if you lose a penny. Now, if you lose your diamond out of your ring, ladies, you're going to cry out. Oh, thank you. Stick to me one minute. Thank you. Your cry is proportionate to the thing you lose. Isn't that right? If it's got value to it, you cry out. If it doesn't have value, no big deal. Oh, I lost a penny. Yeah. But he lost something that had tremendous value. He lost his uh, cutting edge. Again, he doesn't try to work without. He doesn't try and get involved in some other thing. Number 10, his obligation. Alas, master. It says in verse 5, for it was borrowed. That's why I say I believe the cutting edge represents the anointing of the Spirit of God. We never own the Holy Spirit. But we have access, if you like, to the Spirit of God. God, if I could put it in a crude sense, He lends us the Holy Spirit. And we are entrusted with the Holy Spirit. This man was entrusted with somebody else's power. That axe represented power. He could not cut down a tree without. He was powerless without the axe. On the other hand, in one sense, the axe was powerless without the individual. We are laborers together with God. God gives us the Holy Spirit in order to accomplish a given task, you shall receive power, and then you shall be witnesses of me, Judea, Samaria, and most part of the earth. And he recognizes, alas, master, it was borrowed. You know, it's one thing to lose something that belongs to you. It's far worse to lose something that belongs to somebody else. 
Nancy and I, a couple of years ago now, maybe six or eight years ago at least, we were in uh, uh, Pueblo, Colorado for some meetings. At that time, our uh, daughter and son-in-law and grandkids were living in uh, uh, Colorado Springs, which is about 60 miles away, and the pastor seemingly knew that. I didn't know the, uh, well, I knew one couple in the church, and they sort of arranged for the meetings. And, and so uh, he called me on the phone. He said, listen, if you're coming, when you're coming out here, he said, the church obviously will pay for the airfare and so on. But he said, uh, feel free if you want to uh, spend an extra few days with your family. I know you've got family in Colorado Springs. Uh, but, you know, it doesn't matter to us. The airfare will cover it, uh, you know, whether you're there for five days or ten days, whatever. And so it was over the, uh, the weekend of the 4th of July. And uh, we extended our stay for uh, an extra four days. And this gentleman, uh, Hank was a um, military man, although he'd retired, but there were pictures in the house and he was, uh, you know, with his, uh, all of his uh, uniform on and so on, and he was one of these real particular sort of guys. Everything was immaculate. And uh, he had uh, three cars. And he said to me, he said, listen, why don't you borrow my car uh, while you're with your, uh, your uh, family? He said, you'll, uh, you'll need a car. And I, I reasoned with him several times. I said, no, I, I don't think we'll need it. You know, kids have got two cars, you've got a van, you've got another car, and uh, you know, uh, we would not need it. He said, well, listen, you may, you know, it's going to be sitting here anyway, you might as well use it, and, and so on. And it was a, uh, a little Volkswagen, a Volkswagen Jetta, but it had special trim seats inside, you know, some sort of racing type seats, and the thing was absolutely pristine condition, you know. And finally, he sort of twisted our arm almost, because I really didn't want to borrow it. And I said, well, how am I going to get it back to you? You know, we're flying out of Colorado Springs. And he said, listen, just, uh, you know, put the, the keys on top of the uh, wheel well, and, uh, and we know what time you're leaving. We'll come up and, you know, pick it up, and, and so on. And so all the arrangements were made, and uh, we drove the car home. And for two days, three days, we didn't even use it. Never even started it. We just simply drove it, and they were renting a beautiful house at the time. And, uh, it had a, had a long driveway coming up, and these uh, beautiful pines, and uh, in a sort of gated community. And uh, the car just sat there for three days. And finally, the, the night of the 4th of July, they were meeting with some friends, having a barbecue, and they had the van full of food that they were taking and so on. They said, would you mind following us? And so we, you know, we got in the car, and we drove, and we had the evening with these uh, people, came back, and uh, pulled the car up outside the garage, and I went in and helped my daughter uh, unpack the, uh, the van and went to bed. The next morning, our daughter, uh, granddaughter had to uh, help somebody, and, uh, she had to meet them very early, and there was a knock on our bedroom door about 6 o'clock in the morning. And uh, she put her head in and said, Papa, the one, your car's down the driveway, smashed into a tree. And I'm thinking, my, I don't have, you know, you, you're 6 o'clock in the morning, and you know, I don't have a car, you know, we flew in there, and then it dawned on me. You know, so I got up, I put on a dressing gown, and I, I, I got to the door, and I looked, and it looked like this Volkswagen just gently gone down the driveway, down the embankment about this high, and then stopped at the street, and everything looked fine, you know. So I went back to bed, and uh, uh, about 8 o'clock got up, and I thought, oh, I better, you know, go and check this thing out. And when I got there, the thing was totally smashed up. I mean, it had literally sort of wrapped itself around the street. There was a baseball cap in the back of the uh, car that was about 8 feet behind the car. A baseball cap, you know, there's no weight to that. Uh, it must have ripped, and the, the whole thing is better around. We couldn't even get it to drive. The, uh, the wheel well crushed in and so on. And here, you know, I had to call these people. And I called up, and uh, Kim, her name was, uh, answered the phone. And, uh, and it, it was, actually, it was the morning before, that's right, it was the morning before the joint. And so I said, Kim, I said, hi. I said, oh, brother, I know, hi. You know, how's it going? I said, Kim, I got some bad news. I said, yeah, I smashed up your car. Oh, brother Randall, you're always trying to make a joke. <laughs> Would be God, it was a joke. Anyway, long story short, they had to come and pick that thing up, and by then we tried to, you know, the uh, wheel we well out so the car could move, and then the back window was all shattered. And, oh, alas, Master, it was horrible. There is nothing worse than having to tell somebody you've lost something that they entrusted to you. Here is a man that's been entrusted with a weapon, if you like. We have weapons, don't we? The weapons of our warfare. We've been entrusted with the power of God. 
the last master of his life. But he cried out, he realized the desperation. You know, we should cry out, God, that thing, that precious gift that you gave us of the Holy Ghost, I have not been a good steward of your anointing. Master, I've lost it. And so his next thing, number 11, his confession. The prophet says to him, where did it fall? In other words, where did you lose it? And the Bible says that he showed him the place. He knew exactly when he lost it, where he lost it, how he lost it. And he said, it was right there. You know, most of us know the place. Most of us know the situation. It was when I wouldn't forgive a brother or sister. It was when I turned on that pornography <coughs> and my wife went to bed. It was when I went back to an old habit. It was when, you know, most of us can tell, listen, I lost it right then. Two weeks ago, I was doing something I shouldn't have done. You know, three months ago, I did something. Four months ago, five years ago, whatever. We have people in the Bible that lost their anointing. Samson lost his anointing when he broke his vow of separation. Jonah lost it for a while when he disobeyed God. Balaam lost it when he began to merchandise the gift that God had given him. You know, Demas lost his anointing when the world just captured it. And Paul has to write with tears, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. Again, there was a turning point in his life. And so many times, we have men like Jimmy Swagger who lost it after <coughs> visiting a prostitute. You know? And so, I mean, you know, I name him because he's, you know, well-known and so on. I can name other individuals. And they can point to a time or a season in their life when they were disobedient to God, when they allowed some sin to come in or whatever, and they say, that was the turning point in my life. And the prophet says, listen, where did you lose it? Thank God that this young man is willing to acknowledge. I know exactly where I lost it, when I lost it, how I lost it. And he took him to the place and he said it was right there. The next thing is provision. It says in verse 6, when he showed him the place, he threw a stick into the waters. He showed him the place, he cut off a stick and he threw it in. And he made the iron to flow. You know, there's only one answer, and that is a stick. What can a piece of wood do? Does it make sense to the natural mind, does it? That you can throw in a piece of wood and you can cause iron to flow? It's amazing about sticks in the Bible, isn't it? Moses held a stick one day, but it became a rock. Children of Israel complained that the waters of Mara were bitter. They couldn't eat, they couldn't drink the waters. And what does Moses do? He takes a stick and he throws it into the water. I believe that stick in the Bible, of course, is symbolic of the cross. You see, there's an old rugged cross, an old rugged stick, if you like, that if it's applied to your life and restore everything that you've lost, and all you've got to do is confess where you lost it. God, I lost it this night. I lost it that night. I was doing this, I was doing that. And if we confess, our sin. He's faithful and just to forgive us. And we've got to believe that somehow that old rugged cross has the power to change and transform your life and give you back everything that you've lost. It doesn't make sense to the natural mind because the natural mind doesn't understand the things of the Spirit of God. How can throwing a stick into a river cause iron to flow? But it does. God has a provision again for your loss. Whatever it is, that anointing that you once had, that passion that you once had, that prayer that you once had, that prayer life, that devotional life that you once had, that zeal that you've lost, whatever it is tonight, if you're willing to come to the cross and say, God, I want back that thing that I've lost. I know when I lost it, I'm willing to acknowledge when I lost it, and I'm asking for your forgiveness. And it says when he showed in place again, the moment the stick was applied, all of a sudden that thing was restored. And then the last thing is restoration. Verse 7. He says, take it up. Be yourself. I like that because
is here now as an act of responsibility. There is provision made, thank God there is provision made, the old rugged cross, so despised by the world as a wondrous attraction. God has made provision for your restoration. But you know what? You have to take it up. You have to take it. The prophet doesn't reach out. He says to the young man, it's there, there's the provision. You take it up. And that's where faith comes in. That I can have back thing that I've lost. And this young man has to reach out. The enemy will tell you, listen, there is no restoration. You've blown it. It's over with. The enemy's a master at that, isn't it? Keeping us captive. I remember listening to Jack Hayford many, many years ago, and he gave credit really to his brother, who was also in the ministry, about the difference between condemnation and uh, conviction. He says condemnation is when the enemy reaches into the past bring something from the past that's never really been dealt with into the future and he dangles it in front of you to stifle any hope for the future. In other words, here's a gal, maybe she's uh, 45 years of age, she had an abortion when she was 17, and the enemy takes that thing and he brings it into her life and says, remember that abortion when you were 17 years of age, you know, God can never use you. In other words, he wants to stifle any hope for the future. But he said, conviction is when the Holy Spirit reaches into the past, something that was never dealt with, in order to deal with it so that you have a future. Listen, if you'll deal with this, I'll, can, I'll use your life. And sometimes we get placed in the condemnation. We think, you know, I've blown it. It's over with. I've sinned too greatly. Even the blood of Jesus Christ can't cleanse me. There's no way that I am that weighted thing can ever begin to float again. And yet God can do it. Maybe there's some of you here, no doubt in my own mind tonight, but in a crowd of this size, there are people here, and you say, listen, I'm not the person I used to be. Something is missing from my life, and I want it back. I want that passion back. I want that power back. I want that victory back in my life. I'm not going to go out of here tonight without it. Let me tell you, God's made provision. And he's promised where two or three are gathered together, he's here. In all of his majesty, in all of his glory, in all of his compassion, all of his mercy, he's here tonight. And he simply wants you to have back the thing that you've lost. He's a restorer of the what? The years of Locus and the Temple of the Not just the weeks or the days or the hours, but the years. Some of you, maybe it's years. Some of you have given up. Maybe some of you here, you say, listen, when I was a teenager, man, I had vision. I wanted to go to the mission field. I wanted to do this and that. I you know, I used to witness and so on, but somehow, you know, just, it's been years. It doesn't matter how long. The years, the locus of the canker worm of Eden. God is a restorer of all those things. Let's just bow our heads in prayer as well. Close. Father, you know every single one that is represented here. But you know our down sittings, you know our uprisings, you know everything about us. You know the very hairs on our head. Father, there's nothing hidden from you. You said all things are naked and bare before the eyes of him with whom we have to do. And yet, Lord, you're a God that's made every provision necessary. There's nothing we can do to add to it. All we've got to do is reach out and take it. Father, I ask you to touch lives. Give back, Lord, that thing that the enemy has robbed them of, that thing that sin has robbed them of, that thing that disobedience has robbed them of. Lord, whatever it is, we ask, Lord, for a restoration, a revival of that area of their life. Come, Holy Spirit, move right now. Brood as you did even in the beginning, and out of all the turmoil and the chaos and so on, you brought forth a thing of beauty. Do it again tonight. But you were saying, you said, I am the Lord and I changed them. Let's just take a moment. I'm going to ask you just to be brutally honest with you. Self tonight with God. Ask yourself this question Am I satisfied with that? It's a place where I'm at too restraining. Is it too confining? Have I allowed myself to be sort of hemmed in? Lord, I know there's more. I know that you have so much more in store for me. Lord, I want to enlarge my borders. I want to lengthen my states. 
If that's you tonight, just acknowledge that tonight. Maybe we could just quietly stand to our feet. And these altars are open tonight. If you would just stand with me. I'm going to do something that I've done for many, many years. I did it when I pastored. If you want to come forward, just be alone. Let me say that again. Be alone. If you're kneeling at one of these altars or in the front row for that matter, you will be left alone. I believe there's a place where you just need to be with God. On the other hand, if you're standing, I'm going to assume you want some sort of counsel, you want somebody to pray with you. So let me just, at least for the short time that I'm here, if you come forward, you'll be left alone. There were many, many times in my own life when I would have gone to the altar if I knew a bunch of people weren't going to surround me and massage my back and, you know, and so on. I just wanted to be alone with God. I was old enough, mature enough. I just wanted to be quiet in the presence of God. If that's you, just come and kneel. If you want counsel, if you want somebody to agree with you, because the Bible does say, you know, if we agree again, if you're standing, somebody will come and pray. But let's not go out of here. This is not a time to play games, and I know you won't be here if you're just playing games. But if you're brutally honest tonight, say, God, I want back what I've lost. I want the zeal back, I want the power back, I want the compassion that I used to have. Lord, I've become hard, I've become callous, I've become critical, whatever it is. Just allow the Spirit of God to give that to me. He's more than willing, believe me. He's made every provision. That thing is floating, if you like, in front of you, and all you've got to do is reach out and say, Lord, by faith, I receive again that forgiveness. I receive that thing once again, Lord. It's going to take a few more minutes. I'm not a beggar when it comes to all calls. I believe that if God doesn't do the work, certainly I can't do it. But, um, let God just have his way for a few more minutes. If you need to be seated now, you can, just in the presence of the Lord. But, uh, just let God have his way. You can reach out where, where you are. Maybe we could just close that way tonight if you want to tiptoe out. Fellowship in the hallway, the foyer there, there's plenty of room. Just feel free to go. But uh, if you want to just remain in the presence of God, spend a little time in God's presence, voice your own prayer, and uh, you do that. Just let God have his way. God bless you.